Hodge, the great theologian of the old Princeton of the 19th century. One thinker whom Hodge regularly singled out in his three-volume systematic theology was the German theologian Friedrich Schleiermacher. When Hodge had studied in Germany in his younger years, he had seen firsthand the influence of Schleiermacher's liberal theology, and Hodge was deeply disturbed by the German theologian's embrace of the, the rationalist critique of biblical authority, which had the effect, Hodge insisted, of undermining the most fundamental tenets of the historic Christian faith. And at one point where Hodge is setting forth his critique of Schleiermacher, who had by this time been dead for several decades, Hodge offers in a footnote a brief personal comment about the person whose theology he was so severely criticizing. He tells how he as a student had frequently attended services at Schleiermacher's uh, church. And he was taken, he says, by the fact that the hymns sung in those services, and I quote here, were always evangelical and spiritual in an eminent degree, filled with praise and gratitude to our Redeemer. And then he goes on to report that he'd been told by one of Schleiermacher's colleagues that often in the evenings the theologian would call his, Schleiermacher would call his family together saying, hush children, I don't know how you talk this way to your kids, but... Uh, Hush, children, let us sing a hymn of praise to Christ. And then Hodge adds this tribute to Schleiermacher. Can we doubt that he is singing those praises now? To whomever Christ is God, St. John assures us Christ is Savior. My second hero, also from the 19th century, is the Dutch theologian Hermann Bovink. In his systematic writings, Bobbing frequently criticized Roman Catholic theology, not in the least because of what he saw as the Catholic emphasis on salvation by good works. But here's a comment that he offers at one point about that element of good works of Catholic thought. I'm quoting Herman Bobbing. We must remind ourselves, he says, that the Catholic righteousness by good works is vastly preferable to the Protestant righteousness by good doctrine. At least righteousness by good works benefits one's neighbor, whereas righteousness by good doctrine only produces lovelessness and pride. Furthermore, we must not bind, blind ourselves to the tremendous faith, genuine repentance, complete surrender, and fer the fervent love for God and neighbor that is evident in the lives and work of many Catholic Christians. That's 19th century. Free Vatican II. My third example is from a personal conversation with the late Cornelius Van Til, longtime professor of, of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary. I visited him once in his Philadelphia home shortly after I graduated from college, and I asked him some questions about his stern rejection of Karl Barth's theology, which I had come to disagree with Van Til about his assessment of Barth. While others in the evangelical world were welcoming many of Barth's contributions as a clear step back toward traditional orthodoxy, Van Til was insisting that Barth's theology was nothing more than the new modernism in disguise. And he would say things like, Barth's theology is a, a Christ without the cross, it's you know, salvation without the blood. It, it, he would go right down the line, you know, it's, it's bad stuff, he said. And in posing a question to Van Til about this, I began with these words. As someone who does not see Karl Barth as a real Christian, what? And Van Til cut me off right there in, in an excited voice. He said, no, 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 I have never said Barth is not a Christian. If all that, uh, what I have said is that his theology is not genuinely Christian. If all that a person knew about the gospel is what they learned from his theology, they could not come to Christ. <laughs> now, Van Til was saying something here that is simple and straightforward. A person can have, as he viewed it, a highly defective theology and still have a heart that has been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bart, from Van Til's perspective, was setting forth a the theological system that fell far short of biblical fidelity, but that did not mean he was not a genuine Christian. <clears throat> Hodge was making the same point about Schleiermacher. Bad theology, he said. 
but we can tell from the hymns that he sang that he longed to be with his Savior in heaven. And Catholicism in Herman Bobbing's portrayal, righteousness by good works, not a doctrinal formulation that a good Calvinist can live with. But in spite of that, some folks who believe that kind of thing exhibit, as he puts it, a complete surrender and the fervent love for God. And we don't have to look very far in the evangelical world to find persons who would disagree with what I'm setting forth here. An obvious case, I'll get away from Deerfield, Illinois. Uh, uh, an obvious case is uh, closer to Fuller Seminary. John MacArthur, who has been an outspoken opponent of the Evangelicals and Catholics Together group, and particularly of that group's document just on justification by faith, drafted on the evangelical side by, among others, James Packer and Timothy George. In his critique, MacArthur took the evangelical participants to be saying, and I quote, that while they believe that the doctrine of justification as articulated by the reformers is true, they are not willing to say that people must believe it in order to be saved. In other words, they believe that people are saved who do not believe the biblical doctrine of justification. Well, needless to say, MacArthur's assessment of the views of the Catholics involved in the project is open to challenge. The, the late Father Richard Newhouse, one of the conveners of evangelicals and Catholics together, long had argued that the key issue at the time of the Reformation was justification by faith, and that his own move from Lutheranism to the Catholic priesthood was necessitated by his conviction that it was now possible for him to preach justification by faith alone within a Catholic context. Be that as it may, my argument with MacArthur is on a more basic point. Unlike him, I do believe that it is possible for people to be saved without subscribing to the doctrine of justification by faith. Not that I deny the truth of that doctrine. I, I believe it with all my heart. True salvation is by faith alone, made possible through the sovereign grace of God that sent the Savior to the cross to accomplish for us what we as lost sinners could never do for ourselves. But I believe it's possible to be justified by faith without being clear about the doctrine of justification by faith. And I will argue passionately with anyone who denies that doctrine, but with those who show a genuine faith in Christ in spite of what I take to be a defective theology, my argument will go along these lines. Is your theology adequate to explain the saving grace that has transformed your inner being? Is that theology capable of sustaining the kind of faith that you claim? And Van Til's question the bar, is your theology, when spelled out as an evangelistic appeal, capable of presenting the gospel in such a way that people will come to Christ? <clears throat> One reason why I'm especially fond of Hodges' expression of appreciation for Schleiermacher's love of the evangelical hymns is that I am convinced that our theology would often be much better, in much better shape if we paid attention to what we are expressing in the hymns that we sing, or at least the hymns that we used to sing. So I want to conclude with a personal illustration about the connection between hymnody and our engagement with the important issues of the larger culture. Here for me, there's a very special connection between our piety as expressed in our hymnody and the call to pursue justice and peace as agents of Christ's kingdom. I was once asked by a group on a secular university campus to serve on a panel addressing the past, present, and future involvement in the American experiment of our of four faith communities. Judaism, Catholicism, mainline Protestantism, and evangelicalism. Four panelists, it sounds like a bad joke, but a rabbi, a priest, a mainline theologian, and me. Uh, we spoke at, uh, at three sessions throughout the day. In the morning, we talked about the past involvement of each of our faith communities in American culture. And in the early afternoon, we talked about the present involvement of each of our faith communities in American culture. Late in the afternoon, we talked about the future involvement. We prophesied about the future involvement of each of our communities in uh, American culture. And then in the evening, we had a panel discussion among ourselves, and then they threw it open to questions from the audience. 
When we turn to questions from the large audience in the evening session, the first question was addressed to me. A young man stood up and said, Dr. Mao, I really didn't know much about evangelical Christianity. I've heard you talk three times about it today. I think I understand it better, but, but I just have one question that if you answered this, I think it would really nail it down for me. What do you believe that the other three people on the platform do not believe? Well, my uh, longtime colleague and very good friend George Marsden says when Mal gets back into a theological corner, he quotes a hymn. And uh, that's what I did on this occasion. Uh, the Sunday before in our, uh, our local church, we had sung at the end of the service the great hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And the third verse of that hymn, and incidentally, when we get to heaven uh, for the first thousand years, I predict we're going to sing the third verse of every hymn that we skipped uh, <laughs> when uh, song leaders say, let's sing the first, second, and fourth verses. Uh, but the third verse of It Is Well With My Soul, we sang. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glory. Now, you've got to be very careful. The, the bliss is not my sin. Uh, <laughs> But it's what comes after that. But my sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh, my soul, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. And I quoted that that evening, and then I explained it. The rabbi certainly is not going to say that his sins have been covered by the blood shed on the cross. And the Catholic, and I always hedge on this, if the Catholic holds to the teachings and practices that led the reformers in the 16th century to depart from, I got a Catholic colleague here, so I got to be very careful, to depart from the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic is not going to celebrate the once for all character of the sacrifice at Calvary. That was Luther's concern, that Catholics could not say to the people of the day, you can say here and now, no matter what else happens, that it is forevermore well with my soul because of the once-for-all sacrifice that took place on Calvary. i got to say, afterward, the Catholic theologian said to me, I can sing that hymn, and we praise God for the wonderful renewal that has been taking place uh, in the Catholic Church since Vatican II. Um, in the liberal Protestant, who early in the day had made much of his preference for a moral example theory of the atonement as opposed to a an idea of the atonement as substitution or sacrifice or payment for sin, he certainly is not going to say that, the him, that, the, that, that our sins are forgiven because of the blood sacrifice that took place on the cross of Calvary. And that was a good answer, even though I, I thought it up in the moment. The, the hymn writer was offering a profound evangelical testimony that because of the shed blood of Calvary, a sinner who has embraced the promise of salvation can say that his or her sins have been nailed to the cross and that here and now it is forevermore well with my soul. That's a marvelous evangelical piety. And it's solid evangelical theology as well. But that testimony, properly grasped, also must lead in paths of righteousness, of, of, of discipleship. While it is forever more well with my soul today, it is not well in the larger creation that Jesus came to rescue. It is not well in Haiti today. It is not well in the prisons of North Korea today. It is not well in the barrios and ghettos and reservations of North America. It's not well on Wall Street. It's not well in Hollywood. It's not well in the corridors of power in Washington, D.C., and it is not well in the kitchens and bedrooms of Deerfield, Illinois. So that the God who right now looks into every one of our hearts and says, if we have embraced the promises that have been offered to us through Christ, who says that it is well with these souls, is also the God who grieves over the injustice, the environmental damage, the superstition, the abuse of women and girls in the international sex trade, in the war-ravaged regions of Iraq and Afghanistan, and the God who grieves over all of that and more calls those of us whose eternal destinies have been made secure at Calvary not only to share in his grief, but to act as grieving ones in his name, taking up the cause of his kingdom in anticipation 
of that great day when Jesus will return.